Maybe we should thank the Lord for the flies because at least something will keep us awake (laughs) this late afternoon with the heater on and things are beginning to calm down. Let me tell you a little story to uh, maybe betray a bit of our heart for what you do beyond the simple fact that several times in the last 21 years since we came back from Europe, Priscilla and I have said to each other, Maybe when we grow up, we can pastor an international church. Uh, We were a part of an international church in Vienna, Austria, in the early 1980s. We were living in Vienna and primarily working in the former Soviet arena. But we lived in we lived in Austria really as a platform to go somewhere else. So we didn't become a part of the Austrian church. So fast forward um, after. We were back in the United States now some 20 years after we had left Vienna. And all of a sudden, we get a phone call, a phone call from a woman who had been a part of a discipleship group that we had led in Vienna in 1982. So we're talking about 2006, 2007, something like that. We remembered her when she called but we'd had no contact with her whatsoever since we left Vienna. She came to Vienna, like many others, as an aspiring opera singer and left Vienna with a dose of reality. Um, During that time in Vienna, she had uh, met an Austrian man who had come to Christ later in life who also spoke English well. He was also a musician alongside of having a PhD in economics. And so they fell madly in love. We were leading the group of young adults in that international church at that time. And so uh, even as a young married couple ourselves, maybe I think we'd only been married two, three years at the time, uh, we got involved in conversations with them about marriage. And not only was this going to be a multicultural marriage, not only would it be a bilingual marriage, it would be also a biracial marriage. And so as we began asking them questions, um, they decided not to get married. So our first attempt at premarital counseling was not successful if getting married is the goal of premarital counseling. Uh, So we continued to stay involved in her life, and, and then our paths separated. She came back to the United States. We stayed on in Europe for another 10, 12 years. Then we came back to the United States, and as I said, we had no contact with her at all, not because of anything other than just going our separate ways. And then this phone call comes, and she uh, tells us that basically God had laid on her heart to get in touch with people who had impacted her in her spiritual life for the sake of the gospel. And so she had tracked us down. There was no reason for her to know that we were now living in Vienna and through, in, excuse me, in Dallas, she had tracked us down and simply called to tell us what God had done in her life. So long story short, she came back to the U.S. with a renewed desire to serve Christ, finished a Ph.D. in, in some uh, neuroscience a- arena, and had started a consulting company where they helped advertisers know what the brain response was to certain advertising. So the reason you bought your iPhone is because she told them your brain flared up when uh, you saw that ad. She could could track the brain response. But the great thing was, uh, throughout that entire time, she had pursued hard her relationship with Jesus. So I tell you that story just simply to say there are conversations you're having right now that you may not see the fruit of uh, at all, or you may never hear, or you may get that phone call. 20 years from now or 25 years from now. Of course, if I got one 20 years from now, I might not be able to hear it. But nonetheless, the Lord is using you in very powerful ways with a very unique group of people that will, um, who will be all over the world in some ways. So may the Lord bless you in that. I'm sorry? Yeah, exactly. That's good. another story. So a few years ago, I was asked to be the missions conference speaker at, um, back at Dallas Seminary after I'd left. And they called me and said that the theme of the conference is the abundant life. So I had never actually thought of 
the relationship between world missions and the abundant life to my own shame. I hadn't put those two things together. So the, the assignment to speak at that conference and put together or to think about in what way is mission an expression of the abundant life or a privilege of the abundant life was a wonderful challenge to me. So I began to do some reading and thinking about the abundant life. You know the passage, John chapter 10, starting in verse 7. Jesus said to them, uh, said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And then the strong contrast. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly, or as the NIV translates it, have it to the full. Uh, The New King James says it, have it more abundantly. If you look at some other translations, the message says, I've come so that they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. And the New Living Translation says, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. So I think without really being aware of my own theology around this idea, I had developed, as many people have, some idea that there is life in Christ, and then there's abundant life, and that somehow there is something more that is ours than the eternal life that Christ has given us. This this has been a a very real part of Christian thinking and writing. Uh, We hear people talk about the the, uh, victorious life, or some people will talk about a a spirit-filled life that goes beyond what is theirs in Christ, a deeper life. I've heard that phrase as well. And frankly, there, are, there is no shortage of preachers who are very eager to tell you how to get this better life, this more abundant life, this deeper life, this victorious life. <laughs> One time Priscilla and I were driving across uh, central Florida, and we came upon a billboard on the side of the road that said, upgrade your salvation. (laughs) Well, who wouldn't want to do that, right? I mean, if there's more, then I'm, count me in. Um, Sometimes, unfortunately, The sad truth is there are followers to be gained and there is money to be made by promising people that you can give them the secret to a better life, to a more abundant life. It seems to me, maybe I'm mistaken, but it seems to me that part of the challenge here is that all of us recognize there are many whom we know whose confession of Christ means very little in their lives. And so we've attempted to create theological pathways and uh, teachings and, and ideas that somehow help people become or allow people to see their Christian confession as more meaningful in their experience. But then we have to ask ourselves the question, is there any more satisfying life than that which is given by the very breather of life? Think back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, after that marvelous promise, that marvelous, not promise, that marvelous idea, that, that truth, that out of all creation, only humans bear the image of God. And then there's that marvelous correction in chapter 2 after the Genesis 1 telling of the creation narrative, if not correction, a a clarification where God reminds humans that they're really just made from dirt. You may be the image of God, but 
you're formed from dirt. And then formed from dirt comes that marvelous expression, and then God breathed the breath of life into Adam. Remember that? Genesis 2, 7. The marvelous truth there is that the language of the breath of life, in Hebrew, the neshama, is a word for breath that is only associated with God and humanity. Other creatures have breath. That's ruach in Hebrew. And God has ruach. But only God and humanity share neshama. That's life. And as the garden then describes it, it's life in its fullest. Life lived in unencumbered relationship with God. Life with the fulfillment of the mandate as image bearers to enjoy and steward and rule over creation. And not only that, but to fill the earth with other image bearers as man and woman come together. So there's this marvelous picture of life given by the giver of life. And then Jesus says, I've come that they may have life and they may have it abundantly. And you have to ask yourself the question, is there more, is there, could there be a more abundant life than what is already ours in Christ? Is there some kind of a salvation two-step that the Bible gives us? And to be quite frank, I can't find a single scholar of the New Testament who reads John 10.10 10 that way. I can give you links and books from lots of others who read John 10.10 10 that way, but I haven't found a serious exegete of Scripture or biblical theologian who reads John 10.10. 10. I'm not saying they're out there. I haven't found them. So the point is, and the question is, or maybe the, the statement is, the life given by the giver of life to you and to me as believers in Christ is the abundant life. The life of the gospel is the abundant life because we have believed in a gospel of abundance. So if you want to lay out the next three days together, let me give you kind of a my weak attempt at, Uh, a logical progression. We're going to start out by saying the abundant life is a life defined and shaped by the gospel. So let's not try to find a second step, a second blessing, another technique. Let's just say that the abundant life is the life shaped, a life shaped and defined by the gospel. But then we're going to make another statement. And we're going to say a life shaped and defined by the gospel is a life of mission. A life intensely turned outward. A life lived for the sake of something bigger than ourselves. And to make it sound academic which is what we do in seminary to justify the high price of tuition. We'll throw in a Latin phrase. That always makes you more. Ergo, how's that? Therefore, the life of mission is the abundant life. That little progression, the abundant life is a life shaped and defined by by the gospel, And a life shaped and defined by the gospel is a life of mission. And therefore, the life of mission is the abundant life. I think has changed for me to a significant degree how I now think about my life lived in context outside my own and how I think about my own life today and my engagement in mission. So, in order for us to talk about the abundant life as a life shaped by the gospel and defined by the gospel, maybe we need to spend some time going back and thinking about the gospel. And you say, well, I didn't come all the way to France to hear something about the gospel. Well, maybe we ought to uh, re-examine our understanding of that very phrase, gospel. Gospel. 
I'm going to give you a little warning. Warning: This is probably going to be a session that's focused more on kind of reshaping or asking questions about our thinking. Tomorrow we're going to spend a lot of time talking about what we value in our hearts. And then the last two days we're just going to make you mad. So we'll start out with thinking about thinking and then feeling about or looking into our hearts and then a couple of applications at the end. So let's talk about gospel. If you were here yesterday, you, you would remember that the idea or the language of gospel begins to emerge, or the terminology for gospel, I should say, begins to emerge uh, for us in the Old Testament. There are some verbs that talk about proclamation or that talk about declaration in the context of a marvelous victory or the announcement of something significant that has occurred. We looked at Psalm 96 and verse 2, where a word that's translated into English, proclaim, the Hebrew word when it's translated into Greek, is the same word that's used in the New Testament for the word gospel. So the word gospel is literally good news. You've heard that before. And it was used outside of the New Testament to describe or to make known some great accomplishment or some significant event that was important for the for the population. So it could have been the birth of an heir of a monarch, or it more likely than not often occurred around a military victory. I, I know you probably have images in the UK for those great celebrations that broke out when the war in Europe was finally over. And certainly in the United States, we have very powerful images of the celebrations that occurred when the news came that the war in Europe or the war in the Pacific was over. That was good news, right? Very good news for our country. That's the foundation of gospel. Now, the idea, interestingly enough, has emerged in North American Christianity anyway, that the New Testament uses the word gospel in two distinct ways. I want to explore that a bit with you. So, if you can possibly stay concentrating in the late afternoon about some, some theology and nuance, let's, let's go there. Many people would argue that there are two expressions of the gospel, one called the gospel of the cross or the gospel of Christ crucified, and the other called the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the cross and the gospel of the kingdom. And I I would recommend to you a very accessible and, I think, insightful article written by uh, Bob uh, Robert Gulich. Uh, That's the English anglicized word uh, or anglicized version of his name, G-U-E-L-I-C-H. Someone I was talking to was at Fuller. You were at Fuller. Did you have Bob Gulich when you were there? No. Uh, Bob was a New Testament professor at Fuller and at Fuller, and the Lord. it took him home far sooner than I wish he had of. Bob has a, a piece entitled, What is the Gospel? in the fuller um, publication called Theology News and Notes from 2004. I would recommend that to you. You can get it online. If you wonder whether or not Bob's right in asking, are there two different formulations of the gospel, I think basically what he's doing is looking at the history of, of Christian expression in the United States in the 20th century and saying there must be because we see two very distinct understandings of the gospel emerge. If you're a part of evangelicalism, you have grown up in North America, you've grown up out of the controversies of the early 20th century between what was called the modernist movement and the fundamentalist movement. And the fundamentalist movement began to adopt more than anything else the gospel of the cross the gospel of Christ crucified. The progressive movement or the modernist movement began to adopt what evangelicals called the social gospel or the gospel of the kingdom. And so this idea that there are two gospels isn't just a biblical theological idea. You can see it clearly worked out in the history of the church in North America. So let's look at the passages that are used to talk about these two gospels and ask the question, is there two gospels? Or are, excuse me, are there two Gospels? 
The first is 1 Corinthians 15. This is the passage that's most often used to talk about the gospel of the cross. You would know it well. We, we all have memorized these verses. I'll, read, I'll go ahead and start reading in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 15. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preach to you, which you re- received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. So Paul makes it clear that what he's about to write about is the gospel, right? I want to remind you of the gospel, by this gospel. And then he writes this. For what I received, I passed on to you. This is verse 3. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also. So the focal point of this gospel proclamation or this idea of the gospel of the cross is verses 3 and 4 that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. This is sometimes called the Pauline Gospel, sometimes called the Propositional Gospel. And this understanding of the Gospel focuses on a message that announces the selfless act of Christ on the cross as a substitutionary atonement for sin. And then, as we see from other passages, as a propitiation for God's wrath towards sinful and rebellious humanity. This understanding emphasizes the gospel as the offer and provision of eternal life, forgiveness of sins, justification, redemption, reconciliation, and all of those wondrous benefits that particularly Paul lays out for us in his epistolary literature. And I would argue that this understanding of the gospel became preeminent in Protestant Christianity after the Reformation and then was perceived to be recaptured and reclaimed by evangelicalism and fundamentalism in the early 20th century. This is the announcement that something good has happened for you between you and God. As simple as that. Unfortunately, in an individualistic and therapeutic and consumerist society like that within which most of us were raised, the gospel of Christ crucified, if not carefully considered and explained, can often be understood simply as a gospel of personal benefit. A gospel that does something for me. A gospel that gives me freedom in Christ, the forgiveness of sins. And think about how powerful, how central in evangelicalism is the, is, the pre, is the place of personal stories of what Jesus has done for me, right? It's the story that I went into the revival hall, addicted to alcohol, and I walked out of the revival hall completely free of my addiction. Those stories stir my soul. It, it's the story of lives changed and turned around. And for some of us, that's personal story. That's what we experienced when we believed in the gospel. It is, I think, interesting, however, that most of the New Testament and the concepts of the New Testament are not framed in an individualistic, therapeutic, and consumerist society. 
And so the application of the gospel and the understanding of it simply from that perspective may in fact be an incomplete picture of what this great gospel that centered Paul and has become the center of our lives may well be about. Consumerism, Rodney Clapp has told us, is the dominant instrumental value in North American Christianity. If you want to be disturbed in your reading, I would recommend Rodney Clapp's book, The Consuming Passion, Christianity and the Consumer Culture. Uh, Later on, there was a a group called Gospel in Our Culture Network, and uh, they published a book called Stormfront, the, new, the Good News of God. I would also recommend that for you. In that book, they wrote this. Most of us no longer consume to live. We live to consume. Our lives are orchestrated around habits of consumption that no longer serve any higher purpose, but which have become ends in themselves to be desired for their own sake. Now think about it. They're writing this before the penetration of the, email, of the internet into our consumerist behaviors. This is 98. They write, These habits in turn transform our relationships with other people as friendships, even marriages, are entertained around the question of meeting our personal needs. Ouch. Ouch! How many of us, how many times have we thought of the gospel centered around the the satisfaction or meeting of our personal needs? The authors of this book go on and let me read this rather extended quote. Gather a dozen Christians into a room and ask them the question, what is the gospel? The likelihood is that you will receive a dozen different answers. Some Christians will speak about forgiveness of sins, entering into a personal relationship with God by faith in Jesus Christ, and the gift of eternal life. They may add to this the incorporation of the believer into the body of Christ, the new humanity begun in Christ, Other Christians will speak of liberation from oppression and injustice or reconciliation or the restoration of creation. Still others will speak of the power of the Holy Spirit, healing, miracles, freedom from demonic powers, and a joy so intense that words simply cannot express it. Still other Christians will speak of strength in the midst of weakness, courage in the face of suffering, comfort, peace, and the capacity to face death unafraid. All these answers are attempts to explain what is good about the good news. Yet, despite the great diversity among these different understandings of the gospel, they all, they have one theme that unites them. They all speak about the gospel in terms of its benefit on human life, and therefore the gospel is about something good that happens to me. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm glad the gospel has changed me. I'm glad for forgiveness of sins. But here's the amazing thing about living a life in pursuit of meeting your own personal needs. You never get there. All of your needs are never met. And so therefore... There must be another step to the abundant life. That's more than what you've experienced so far in your Christian life. There's another way, another prayer to be prayed, or maybe another donation to be given before you can really experience all that God has for you. How many of us have experienced and been with those who have experienced severe disappointment 
with God because the promises made to them in their understanding of the gospel just don't seem to be happening. They're still poor. They're still sick. They're still broken or estranged from the relationships. They're still dominated by fear. They still don't have all that they thought Jesus was supposed to give them when they believed, which they were promised in this gospel of the good life, this gospel of personal benefit. So, I would say a hundred times over, the gospel is the offer of something good. But it's never the offer of something that is just for our good. The gospel is the announcement of something good for the whole creation. And that good is Jesus. It seems to me that more often than not, we revel in forgiveness more than we revel in the one who forgives. We revel in redemption more than we revel in the Redeemer. We revel in victory over sin more than the one who won that victory. The gospel doesn't just rescue us from Satan's reign of terror. It recruits us into God's redemptive mission. It gives us a place in what's good for all creation through our faith in Christ. In Christ, not only do we hear the good news, but in almost every regard, we become the good news. A tactile, audible, visible expression of life given by the giver of life. Life in relationship with God. That probably is then the best way to think about the other use of the term gospel, which I'd like for us to consider. So go to Mark chapter 1 with me. Mark chapter 1. The very opening of Mark's gospel tells us that this gospel is about the gospel. He says it this way, verse 1 of chapter 1, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. The language comes up, the term comes up again in verse 14 in talking about the preaching of John the Baptist. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God, the gospel of God. What was this gospel of God? He said, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the gospel or believe the good news. This use of the word gospel is sometimes called the gospel of the kingdom. You can find it in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23 as well, where we read this. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogue, proclaiming the good news, that is the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among his people. This use of of the word gospel is based in the great prophetic tradition of the Old Testament, where the promised Messiah the one who would restore God's kingdom would come. The gospel of the kingdom is the announcement that Messiah has come. And Messiah then has inaugurated the restoration of God's kingdom in fulfillment of what he's promised. It's the announcement that Christ has ushered in a new reality has dethroned Satan and has instituted a new regime. Now, you say to yourself, that's just all rabbi talk. That's just theologian stuff. Go back to your seminary where, you pay, where people pay you to talk this way. And I would argue to you that the gospel of the kingdom 
is as this worldly as it is otherworldly. It is not just a spiritual reality. It establishes the fact that God's presence in the world through his people is actually the inauguration of something that had not been experienced before. Unfortunately, in a society like North American society, with a rather unflagging and even arrogant optimism about our ability to shape the future, the gospel of the kingdom can become little more than a gospel of social benefit. So the gospel of the cross in an individualistic and therapeutic culture and consumerist culture can become the gospel of personal benefit. But in an optimistic and, let's say, arrogant culture that ha- believes it has the ability to shape its future, the gospel of the kingdom can then become little more than a gospel of social benefit. This was the, the legacy of American mainline Protestant liberalism. And interestingly enough, we tended to think about the gospel of the kingdom as nothing more than just social activism and political engagement. So, the way this grows, out of, grows up is then those who believe in the gospel of the cross call the people of God to proclamation of what Jesus has done for them. And those who believe strongly or only in the gospel of the kingdom calls the people of God to social and political engagement. If I could reflect with you for just a moment, I would take you back to the 1970s when I first became committed to Christ through the ministry of of what was then known as Campus Crusade for Christ and then went to seminary. Quite frankly, evangelicals in the 70s were rather smug. 1976 had been designated by Time Magazine as the Year of the Evangelical. And as we looked around us and perceived what was happening in the United States, at least, we saw mainline Christianity on decline and evangelicalism ascending. And to be honest with you, at that time, if you'd paid careful attention, you could have heard evangelicals say, that's because those liberals have given up their commitment to the gospel. And we haven't. That's because those liberals have gotten involved solely in social activism and political engagement. And they've given up the great gospel of Jesus. Okay. Now fast forward, let's say, to 2016. Forty years later, Tremendous amount of questioning among evangelicals today. A keen awareness that evangelicals are being marginalized and sidelined in American culture. And you ask yourself the question, what happened 40 years ago? What's changed from that period when we thought we were ascendant to a period of intense self-doubt. Back in the 70s, we were saying liberal churches are declining because they're heavily engaged in politics. Hmm. I miss the 80s. We lived in Europe for the 80s. Many of my friends have said if you had to miss a decade, that was a good one. But during the 80s, we saw evangelicalism become very closely aligned with partisan political engagement. Partisan political engagement that in almost every regard alienated us from major portions of the population and quite frankly made Jesus reprehensible in the eyes of many. Does that mean that The gospel has nothing to say about the way society organizes itself and the way power is used, that the gospel has nothing to do with seeking the common good among whom believers live. 
I would say to you, absolutely not. In fact, the gospel of the kingdom is exactly the opposite. The gospel of the kingdom says that something new has happened on the earth. That all of the earth's kingdoms have been dethroned and that the kingdom of God is ascendant. The problem hasn't been that we were engaged in in the social fabric of North America, it's the fact that we engaged in a way that utilized the values of this world rather, rather than the values of the kingdom. Now, I'd be the first to tell you that as I began to interact with students in North America and I, I kept hearing language of social engagement and justice, I got nervous because I was a child of the 70s where we had the real gospel, the gospel of forgiveness of sins. And I would be the first to tell you that I had drunk deeply from the idea that there was a true gospel and there was a false gospel, and that a gospel of social and political engagement was a false gospel. And I've had to repent. I was blinded by my own arrogance and by my own lack of concern. What I see today in students is a deep awareness of and willingness to pursue the gospel of the kingdom as they engage in issues of justice and oppression and compassion. I see this as a fantastic correction to the evangelicalism that I knew and grew up in. A filling out of our understanding of gospel. Doesn't mean it's without its problems. Many of you know Ron Sider. You know that name? When he wrote Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger, it was so easy for me to set that book aside because he didn't come with the right evangelical credentials. Yet Ron has been a consistent and pers- a persistent voice for evangelicals to be engaged in justice. In 2011, he wrote a series of letters to what he called this generation. And in those letters, he posed four questions to them. The first was this. Do you care as much about inviting non-Christians to embrace Christ as Savior and Lord as you do about social justice? Ron was known as the father of, in many, for many regards, the movement of social justice. He wrote this, You know how much I affirm your commitment to justice for the poor and your rejection of an evangelism that focuses only on the soul and neglects people's material needs. I've spent much of my life arguing on biblical grounds for precisely these concerns. But I have also watched some Christian social activists lose their concern for evangelism. Here's his phrase. Evangelism and social engagement are inseparable. They are two sides of the same coin, but they are not identical. Working for economic development in poor communities or structural change to end systemic oppression is not the same thing as inviting persons persons who do not now confess Christ to embrace him as Savior and Lord. If we only do social action and never say we do it because of Christ, our good deeds only point to ourselves and make us look good. And I would say if we only do personal evangelism and do not speak out against injustice and sacrificially serve the poor, then our good deeds, our good words, only point to us and not to the needs of others. So, what I want to say to you is that there is not two Gospels. There are not two Gospels. There is a Gospel that engages us in what we have consistently held to, a Gospel of spiritual change, newness of life, 
and the defeat of Satan and a gospel that talks about the inauguration of a new regime. How do I put those two things together? Well, go back to 1 Corinthians 15 for me, or with me. 1 Corinthians 15. Can you put the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the cross together? That's the question. And it seems to me that Paul does that for us. Now, there are some who would deny this. So I was trained in a theological tradition that tended to create time periods when certain truths were true, certain truths were evident, and then they were set aside. And there were those who would say that the gospel of the kingdom was set aside when Israel rejected the offer of the kingdom in rejection of Jesus. And then the gospel of the cross became valid. I don't think that's right. What I would say is when Paul writes this, for what I received I pass on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He's actually bringing together the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the cross into the gospel. How? Well, think about it this way. When Paul intentionally chooses Christ, he doesn't say, for example, that Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He doesn't say the Son of God died for our sins according to the Scriptures, although he certainly could have said both of those things. When Paul intentionally chooses the language of Christ, He is intentionally choosing a messianic title that itself declares the inauguration of the kingdom. And so when Christ, the gospel of the kingdom, died for our sins, the gospel of the cross, according to the scriptures, that's the biblical gospel that pulls together both testaments And the prophetic fulfillment of what God has revealed is true. Not only that, I would argue, if you look at the end of Paul's ministry, after most of the epistles, if not all of the epistles, have been written, in Acts chapter 28, we read this, For two whole years Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him, He proclaimed, what? The kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. I guess you could argue that Ephesians and some of those prison epistles were written after this description, but certainly if they were written during that period of time whenever Paul was somehow detained by the Roman authorities, what Luke heard him saying is he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this idea that there are somehow two Gospels, that one supersedes the other, it seems to me, it seems to me, is unnecessary. There is one Gospel. And it is, in fact, a Gospel of Christ crucified. And it is, in fact, a Gospel of the Kingdom. Maybe Isaiah 52 is where we ought to, ought to dock the ship If you were to go back to Isaiah 52 with me, verse 7, you would read this. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. That's gospel. Who proclaim shalom or peace. Who bring good tidings. That's gospel. Who proclaim salvation. That's deliverance. Who say to Zion, Your God reigns. That's kingdom. So you have gospel. You have deliverance and salvation. You have new life or fullness of life. Shalom. And you have kingdom all wrapped into Isaiah's prophetic vision. So, what's the point of all this? It seems to me that a life defined and shaped by the gospel that is, an abundant life, is a life that sees the fullness of the gospel. Not just a part of it, 
that Christ died for our sins, although we would argue that Christ's death on the cross is, in fact, what makes the inauguration of the kingdom a reality. But that also sees the establishment of God's kingdom as the dethroning of all other kingdoms and the establishment of a kingdom that is not of this world. A kingdom that is based in values and in practices that are completely different. Okay, now, we're going to talk about this a lot more at the end of the week. But if the gospel is that which ushers us into the reality of a kingdom not of this world, then doesn't it make perfect sense that Peter would define the people of God as aliens and strangers? Does it not make perfect sense that Paul would then say that our citizenship is in heaven and that you and I as the people of God because of the gospel established just as Philippi was an outpost of the Roman Empire, outposts of righteousness as the citizens of heaven. Wherever we are, where life is lived in its fullest against the values of this world by the values of the kingdom of God. And so rather than the gospel being simply a story of personal benefit, I am now saved, I've believed, I've forgiven. Rather than just being that, the gospel is an invitation for the saved and the forgiven and the reconciled to establish the presence of the gospel, the presence of the kingdom in a place that is dead. The presence of life in the midst of death. That's the great gospel we have believed. That's the great privilege that we have been given. Probably the most vivid illustration of this that, that I've personally experienced is in the Sabra Shatila slum in South Beirut. Uh, anybody been down there? Know that region? Yeah. So you would remember Shatila was the place where in the 1970s, when there was civil war in Lebanon, the Israelis shut down the exits to a Palestinian slum and helped the Christian militia in North Lebanon, northern Lebanon, central Lebanon, target Palestinians. Thousands were killed. It is a place of boiling hatred. Alongside of Shatila is Sabra. Sabra is the place where people live whom no one wants to admit is worthy of being alive. Gypsies, the poorest of the poor, and now hundreds of Syrians who have in many cases pushed out the poorest of the poor from the worst living conditions you could imagine. I'll never forget the first time I went to Sabra Shatila. I'd been in Mumbai. I'd been in the slums of Nairobi. I'd been in the slums outside Guatemala City. I had never experienced a place that felt more chaotic, more dangerous, more broken, more hateful, than Sabra Shatila. It is a place that is desperate for life. So you walk down these broken streets full of broken bottles and broken lives and you come to a, an iron gate and you step through that iron gate and the first thing you notice is the first bit of color that you've seen since you entered the slum, a blue wall. It's not you in blue, but a blue wall. And then you notice that, or you realize for the first time, you see people interacting with one another in non-threatening ways. They're not raising their fists. They're not yelling. And then you realize that for the first time since you stepped foot in the slum, you actually see people laugh. 
And then you realize that you see people there with intense needs who have hope. You haven't seen any color. You haven't seen any people, anybody relating to another with any sense of civility. You certainly haven't heard laughter. And you definitely haven't seen hope on your way to that little iron gate. In that courtyard, what you find is a group of believing women, Christians, confessors of Jesus, who against all odds in the opposition of the Lebanese government and the local mob and some of the Islamic extremists have created a medical clinic where people find healing and hope and life in a place of death. Perhaps if you have time, you could walk a quarter of a mile down those broken streets again and walk into the courtyard of a school where for the first time you see children who are clothed, who have shoes, children who look clean, children who are engaged in play, laughing, not fighting. Oh, you may see one with a scar on his face or a broken bone from what happens in the community. But in that place, you realize there are a group of Christian women teaching boys and girls who've never been in a school how to sit in a chair, how to hold a pencil, how to have a conversation with someone and not get into a fist fight. What are they teaching them? Life. Life. Abundant life. So you ask yourself the question, my goodness, is the gospel just about me feeling better about myself? Is it, is it just about me knowing that I'm forgiven or just about me believing that somehow I'm overcome something? Or is it the privilege to dive into life for those who are dead, to create life in the midst of death? The gospel of the kingdom fills out our opportunity to only see the gospel of the cross as something selfish and turns us into the people of God's mission. Now, I would say to you that I didn't begin to think this way until I was well into my 50s. I'm ashamed of that, embarrassed by that, convicted by that, oh, I'm not going to stand up here and say that I wasn't saved or that somehow those who led me to Christ in the 70s didn't do something right or that those who taught me the Bible were nearsighted. I'm not going to begin to say any of that. What I am going to say to you is this. The gospel means more to me today than ever. Because it's now my life as the source of life, as Christ lives in me. That's way more powerful than any hearing of the gospel that I had heard before. So, is the way of the gospel a way of abundant life? Of course it is. And is it the way of mission? Indeed it is. So, today was the gospel of, or the gospel of abundance. Tomorrow, I want to talk about Jesus. Pretty good idea? And what I, what I want to talk about is the Jesus of abundance. I'm going to ask you a question. Is Jesus enough? Before you say yes, at least spend some time thinking about it with me tomorrow. Okay? So let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for these moments, for this opportunity to think, for this opportunity to be challenged, for this opportunity to be encouraged 
with what you have done on our behalf. So we want to say that the gospel is first about you, Lord. First about what you have done. And secondly, about the privilege of becoming a part of that. Save us from simply believing in a gospel of personal benefit or a gospel of social benefit and give us life, life abundant, so that we can become life for those who are dead. Amen.